Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba <laughs> Greetings and salutations, internet lovers. I'm Ramin. I'm Michael. And today we are discussing, I think, an album that is one of both of our favorites Little Earthquakes by Tori Amos. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. It's Definitely by one of my favorite artists. And it's in my top five of her albums, but being top five, since she's one of my favorite artists, that puts it really high. This is a great album from 1992 in which Tori finally gets to write what she wants to write. We talked about her album, Why Can't Tori Read before this? And it sort of felt like, as Ramin said several times in the video, that she was being muffled. Like she had an idea and then the record execs and producers just sort of like put a stop to her thoughts and sort of left a lot of these songs that she wrote for it feeling kind of not like a Tory song. With Little Earthquakes, it feels like the Tory that we know and love. Do you think that there is a central theme or motive to this album? My first thought is frustrations at being oppressed, but that is so pervasive in all of Tori's music that it feels a little strange to give this album in particular that theme as a label. This album has been in my life for almost as long as the album has been a thing. My brother was into Tori when he was younger and probably not in 92, but probably by 94, he was a big Tori fan and had this album and I listened to it with him or I borrowed it from him and listened to it a lot on my own. Listening to it as a kid, I didn't really find a through line in these songs, but listening more intently now and also going through and finding interviews where Tori talks about what the songs are about, I do feel like there is sort of a through line and that is growing up, becoming your truest self, but also wanting to have a connection to your past self, to how you felt as a child and the closeness with your family that you had as a child, but also at the same time growing up and being your own self outside of childhood and family. There are a couple outliers in that, but I think a lot of the songs really do have something to do with that. I love this one. I think it's a great way to start the album, especially because around this time, people's image of Tori was, you know, kind of light rock. And I think this song kind of shatters that expectation of like mom rock, for lack of a better word. I have this running theory that for all of Tori's good albums, the first track on the album really sort of tells you what you're in for in the album and the second track then amplifies that which i think is more evident in later tory albums but it's still sort of here too crucify was never one of my favorites but it is a very good song as i was listening through certain parts of it like the melody in particular i thought the melody was too simple but then i thought you know this is a pop song the melody should be simple so that people can sing along this also made me come up with something else that I think sort of goes through this album. Most of this album is very syllabic in its text setting. There's one pitch per syllable of text, but in most of the songs, the most important part is where the melisma comes in. So in Crucify, that's on the word chains, suddenly we have this long melisma on the word chains. It kind of is the point of the song, breaking the chains. I like Crucify. Uh, I like the lyrics. I also like that simpler med melody. There is some really cool percussion in this, even though it's mostly very simple, but I really like the way, I, I think it's a clave, is recorded. Yep. It sounds like it, with this tons of reverb on it, and it sounds like the second hit might be reversed. It's really cool, and it adds a lot of depth to the texture of the song. One of my um, only complaints about this album as a whole is that generally I would like a little more timbral variety in orchestrations and instrumentation, but this song is not an example of that. I think that it uses a good variety of instrumentation to sort of keep your ear interested. I actually prefer Girl to Crucify. It has a more interesting melody, I believe. I don't love the string synth that she uses in the song. Otherwise, timbrely, I really like how the guitar works in the song and how it's more atmospheric than it is melodic or harmonic. So that sort of gives you this like eerie floating sound. But then with the bridge, there's a key change and suddenly all of these timbres sort of flood out and it's a much more wet texture than it had been 
prior to that. I agree. I think the melody of this song is one of its top selling points. It doesn't quite have the same rhythmic intensity as Crucify has in parts of Crucify, but I think that that is more fitting for the subject matter. We forgot to say this about Crucify. So Crucify is about being true to yourself in a way, and Girl is sort of a similar theme, being your own self instead of being the self that others want you to be. So I think those both sort of tie into my thought of the theme of the album. Yeah, I think that the main line in the song for me that ties it together is, she's been everybody else's girl, maybe one day she'll be her own. It's such a quotable line that I'm surprised that people don't say it more. Or that this song hasn't been covered more. I feel like any number of indie hipster singer-songwriter girls could make a good cover of Girl and it would it would hit hard still. I really like this one. It is an example of what most people now think of when they think of Tori Amos. It's got, again, that I'm not trying to be condescending, but for lack of a better word, that mom rock sound. But the song has more depth to it, I think, than many big mom rock blockbuster hits. Like, it's not just, I love you so much. There's a lot to unpack when you really sit down with the lyrics. Unlike you, my first time listening to this, as you know, was as an adult, because you recommended this album to me. The first time I listened to it as an adult, knowing all that you had told me about Tori, all that I had researched and learned, I kind of assumed that this was, spoiler alert, this was the track about uh, sexual assault that happens later. But it's not really, I don't think it's just about that or maybe even about that at all. I feel like it's kind of a forgotten feminist anthem in a lot of ways. I think a lot of people take this as a song of healing. A lot of the survivors of assault that Tori speaks to intentionally do gravitate towards Silent All These Years, not because the song is about healing from assault, but it is sort of a self-healing song anyway. There's part of me that you don't know about. I don't have the way to express it yet, but someday I will, basically. That could be used for any number of emotions. And I think Tori did that intentionally. And I think it's understandable why this is often her most loved song across her entire career. Interestingly, she was originally writing this for someone else to perform. And her boyfriend at the time convinced her, no, you got to keep that one for yourself. Interesting. I don't want to focus too much on the lyrics alone, though. There is also a lot musically to unpack in this song. I think it's really great how the sections of the song contrast dynamically, harmonically, Ironically, even in tempo and it sort of goes back and forth with this push and pull of like the quieter sections in the opening and then the more vulnerable sections later on on an overarching like eagle eye perspective it's text painting what the song is about which is about all these little insecurities that men and women and everybody in between experience that are so small in the grand scheme of things that I think most people think it's inappropriate to express them. So she's kind of like musically painting a picture of holding it in and then letting it out, holding it in, letting it out. That's my favorite kind of text painting. Another thing that I wanted to talk about with the song is that little winding piano ostinato that happens throughout it. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of metric recontextualization that happens. It's kind of hard to hear whether that starts on a downbeat or as a pickup. And then when Tori starts singing and the descending higher piano line comes in, then it's sort of like, oh, that's where the meter is. And I think that's kind of a cool trick, but also that little winding thing, which occasionally just turns into a do ti do do ti do sometimes once it stops winding. It's sort of, to me, it's what you're saying about text painting. It's these things inside you that need to come out. And it also creates a little bit of dissonance with the other things going on. That T in the piano that's just sort of slightly buzzing and hanging there is adding so much warmth and texture, but also that little bit of dissonance that I think is really effective in this song. A lot of my notes that I took on this was that it's simple, but it's as simple as it should be for this song. This is, you know, everyone's favorite on this album. And especially when I was a teenager, but still a little bit now, I sort of scoff at the things that are everyone else's favorite. I got to pick a different favorite that's cool but this is a worthy favorite. I think it's a great song. This is one of my early favorites, and I think it's so needed on this album, actually, because it's, again, sort of dealing with what's expected of us, the sort of cages that we're put in by society, by our family, whatever. But it's dealing with it in a, in a slightly angrier way. It's, you know, anger is useful sometimes. And here it's like, we need to let them break, let them wash away. Whenever people have a preconceived notion about Tori Amos when I bring her up, I direct them to this song. I think there's other 
there are other plenty of other good examples to break that misconception of her being mom rock. But this one, I think, is probably one of the more radio friendly ones for maybe people who don't listen to alternative artists or indie artists as much. This might be my favorite on the album. I just love everything about this song. I love the driving 16th note motive. I love the timbral variety. I tend to not be a huge fan of electric guitar, mostly because when it's used in situations like this, it's often overused. And I think that this is just enough electric guitar. It's like the icing on the cake. It's not overpowering the song. It's just adding and elevating to the song. I like that the most intense moments are really the quieter moments. To me, the line that sticks out the most is, said you're really an ugly girl, but I like the way you play. That is like a perfect wrapped up in a bow example of misogyny. There are many times when in female empowerment moments in media, the woman gets this like big vindicating monologue. But what I like about this one is that it's just living with that pain. She never gets a like, haha, fuck you, I win moment. And it feels even more intense because of that. I really like her nonverbal vocal expression in this song. The wails that she lets out at different points. It's like, where was that on the last album? <laughs> but also going back to the instruments, I, I again really like the percussion on this album and like the drums here are very simple. They're, they're not doing anything complicated, but each hit of the snare with the snares off sounds like a gunshot. It's so big and boomy and it's punctuating all these points that are quite simple, but it's really adding more to the texture than it is to anything else. And like you said, it really does come at the perfect moment in the album where you think, okay, we're going to be all pretty much, you know, moderato to slower songs, soft, sweet songs, and it sort of punches you in the face for that expectation. <laughs> I used to really love Winter, but this song has cooled for me a lot. Not intentional pun. But I think part of that is because it comes right after Precious Things. And I think there's not much you could put after Precious Things that wouldn't be kind of a letdown just because of the sequencing of the album. It's not a bad song, though. Going along with the themes, you know, this is growing up, becoming an independent person, but still wanting to have that connection to your father and the protection that he offered Tori at the time. Precious Things lyrics were a little bit more nuanced. In Winter, they're very cut and dry straightforward, which is not a bad thing. It's just like, oh, now that I know that you can do more interesting things, I kind of wish you had. I really like this one actually still. Um, I think it's really sweet. The qualms I have with it are similar to yours. I think that the orchestration is a little, you put it better than I can, so I'll use your phrasing here. I think it's a little on the nose. I almost would prefer if this song were just piano. I think that that makes more sense for the sentiment because what I love about this song is how it feels so bare and naked. I think it would fit the idea of winter more if it were just piano. But I think it's a sweet melody. It almost in some ways feels like a folk song. I like the theme because parent and child isn't really a theme that we hear a lot in pop music. I can think of a few other examples, but not many. And if we do, it's mostly mother and daughter. We don't really hear, well, no, they're, they're songs about daddy here and there. They're more often rebellious songs, the ones that I can think of. You know, like, I'm not going to be the girl you want me to be. But in this, she loves her dad and she misses that time when he could be the only one that she needed for protection and care and support. And usually if there is a parent-child song, it's like, you know, because you loved me. It's so, it's, I'm grateful for you. And, which is still a lovely sentiment, but kind of a simpler one by comparison. So this is actually one of my least favorites on the album. And I think it's just that I kind of don't jive with the tone of it. I almost want to say the tone is a little too comic for me. I'm not even sure I would call it a funny song. I still think it's a good song. I really love there's Judy Garland taking Buddha by the hand. I think that's super charming. But if there's a track I skip on the album, it's typically this one or China. I agree with what you're saying about it feeling a little maybe not quite genuine, especially surrounded by so many like serious songs. But I think for that reason, I actually really like this being in this spot in the album. Just being this like, again, not funny, but goofy, silly, charming song. Yeah, it definitely um, functions as a palate cleanser well. Especially between the two weakest sappy songs on the album, in my opinion. I think it's fun, and I like how there are a lot, lots of planning fourths and fifths in the piano. A lot of the rest of the album up to this point, each individual section of the song 
has been really clearly delineated with textural changes, like instruments changed the amount of wet versus dry texture changes in different sections of the song. But then in Happy Phantom, they start to change within a section, like what you were just saying, when she gets to there's Judy Garland taking Buddha by the hand. That's actually a big textural change, but it's within a verse. It's not a new section. I like that she's playing with things like that at this point in the album. We should be clear here that even when we're saying these tracks aren't our favorites, we still gave them pretty good scores. A Tory track that's not my favorite is still probably something I like a lot better than some songs by some other artists. Yeah, especially for her first few albums. China is sort of an interesting case for me. As far as Tory songs go, I don't think it's that good, but I connect with it in a way that I have not specifically shared the emotion that Tori gives in songs usually. If you're following specifically what she's laying out, it does really need to come from a feminine perspective a lot of the time. And I feel like China is a song that doesn't necessarily need to come from a feminine perspective. And I have felt the feelings that she felt in China. I felt the dissolution of a relationship. It's and and I can't stop it, but it's not a clean break. It's just like a very slow drift. Not the kind of thing that you can really grieve. There's no one point. I think appropriately, China sounds kind of simple and hollow. It's not blowing the candle out. It's waiting until the wax melts all the way down. I think I like this song lyrically more than I like it musically. The song itself is a little dull by comparison to the other tracks on the album. I think that being only piano would help fix Winter. I'm not sure that it would fix this. But I do find it really interesting that you wrote that Tori was apparently listening to lots of Barbra Streisand when she wrote this, because it makes so much sense. It's very the way we were. She was intentionally trying to write the like big schmaltzy ballad. But I think her, the twist on it is that it's such a specific emotion that is not big. Leather is similar in a lot of ways to Happy Phantom in that it sort of feels like it's tonally a little out of place, but I think it's another spot where it's really needed. And it's a fun little like wink and a nod to the sexuality that we get more of from Tori later in her career. And she even has a story that she told in some interview that she met a woman who was a pole dancing instructor and said, oh yeah, I actually teach lessons to leather and you should come and see it sometime. And at the time, Tori was not as comfortable with her sexuality as she came to be later. And she went to this pole dancing class and watched these women pole dancing to leather. She said that it kind of helped her move a little bit closer to being comfortable with her own sexuality. Even though I don't like Happy Phantom as much because it's so campy, I actually do like this song. I think the camp factor here is a little more understated than in Happy Phantom. And I really like how she uses phrasing and vocal textures in this song. I love her little moments of whispering and she doesn't overuse these little phrasing tricks with her voice. She uses it just enough. I will say the only thing I would like in this song is just a little bit more textural complexity. It doesn't need a lot. I like that this song feels sort of introverted, but I would have liked maybe one more instrument or maybe one more moment of textural contrast. I sort of disagree with your point about it's not being super campy. And my only reason for saying that is nice, big, fat, shaga. I'm not saying that it's not super campy. <laughs> I'm saying that she holds her moments a little bit more. That is probably the campiest moment of the song, which by comparison, I would say the campiest moment in Happy Phantom is probably bigger. I gave this one a perfect score in all categories. This song is super meaningful to me because, again, I listened to this in my adulthood, not in my childhood, and it was just a really pivotal song that got me through coming out to my family. I think one reason why Tori has such a big queer following is that thing you always hear people say about writing songs and writing books and, you know, writing, which is that the more personal you make the lyrics to you, ironically, the more universal it is to people. This one is, I think, again, about that process of maturing and kind of eclipsing your parents' hold over you a little bit. But what I like about this one is there are so many like unresolved questions about the lyrics as you listen. Like, mother, the car is here. Wait, what car? Like, when I dance for him, wait, what? I like the mystery that this song has because it, again, sort of makes it easier to map your own emotions onto the song. What you were saying about the car, I like that the car is something different each time she sings about it. Specifically, she describes a different car each time. But the first time it sounds like a boy coming to pick her up for a dance when she's in high school. 
and she knows she's going to come home. So her mom's going to leave the light on so she can find her way home. But then later, it sounds like she's moved out of the house. She's starting a relationship with someone and she doesn't want to lose herself in that relationship. So she hopes that her mother will leave the light on metaphorically then at that point so that she can find her way back to some feeling of her true self that she might have felt more connected with in childhood. But again, that ties in with what I think the overarching theme of the album is. I really love that this is just Tori and her piano and it feels so perfectly composed without anything else there and to that point, I actually think this might be the best written song on the album. It's so specific and personal to Tori and she's able to milk more out of that when she has complete control out of everything that's happening. Whereas when we have the songs that have, you know, a string section or even a full orchestra in them in some tracks, she didn't write those parts. And so that's sort of like someone else's interpretation of her at those moments. And this is just her. And it, I, feel, I feel like it really benefits from that. In some ways, as I'm like sort of singing both songs in my head, Something about this song feels like a parallel to Silent All These Years. And I don't mean thematically, I'm more I'm more talking musically. They feel sort of similar in form, right? They have a lot of those like little lingering transitional moments in the piano. There's a lot of variety in the sections. It does follow the traditional verse refrain format of a pop song, but because of her timing of when she changes textures and harmonic shifts too, it doesn't quite feel the same. You know, little things about the performance that you were just getting at she can pull back in both tempo and volume for things like it's going to change my name it tells you how we're supposed to feel about that even if it's not a specific feeling but you get a feeling and i think that actually is more interesting than giving you a really specific feeling like this isn't this isn't film scoring this is songwriting so i have a fun story about this when i was in grade school in music class, if we were good for X number of days, if like no one got yelled at, then we would get to have a record day in which everyone was allowed to bring in music to play for the class. And the teacher would sit on her stool with, you know, one foot higher on a higher rung and one on a lower rung and just kind of like get into whatever anyone brought in. I was probably in like sixth or seventh grade and I really wanted to bring in Tori's song, Icicle. So I asked my brother if I could borrow that. And he's like, maybe you shouldn't play that song. And he couldn't really explain why. We'll get to that album soon enough. So I like was going through the lyrics on all of her songs in the, in the liner notes. And the one that I found that was probably the safest that I still really liked was Tear in Your Hand. So I brought in Tear in Your Hand and, you know, my music teacher jammed out to it sitting on her stool. Oh, I loved her. She was such a great teacher. This in some ways kind of feels like a slight callback to Why Can't Tori Read in how radio pop it feels. But then a lot of things like her performance and a lot of the little touches in this song take it away from that. Like this would have never gotten wide radio play. One thing that I really wanted to point out is one of my favorite vocal performances of hers on the album is the lines smashing in a cold room. The, smashing in a cold room. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know what that's about, but it, <laughs> I, I have feelings about it. <laughs> yeah, I like this one a lot. Um, I agree that it's more quote unquote radio friendly, but it's memorable without really being catchy. Like sometimes I will hum precious things to myself, but I'd never really catch myself humming this one. But it doesn't mean I don't like it. I really like the little descending motif, the da 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 It feels very 90s. I really like that this song is kind of about emotional manipulation, right? You don't know the power you have with that tear in your hand. Again, not really a topic that songwriters write about, certainly not with this level of finesse and nuance. I like that she's expressing frustration with that without, you know, how dare you, oh, they cry and try to make, you know, she's not ranting. She's just kind of, again, expressing. I like the use of stopping and starting in this, like that moment in the bridge, maybe it's time. However, I do think this song feels a little bit held back in comparison to some of the other songs on the album. And maybe that's for the best because it's between two of the more vulnerable songs. And it's, I mean, the song that it's before is really heavy. So maybe we needed that, again, palate cleansing moment on the album. And I liked 
to think of the entire song as happening in the moment that the very first line describes, oh, the world just stopped now. So like this whole song takes place in a split second in Tori's head. And these are just the things that she's rushing through and spinning around in that split second, which is really just a whole universe within itself. It's a perfect five out of five song that I can't really listen to very often. It's so vulnerable. Similarly to Tear in Your Hand, it's, you know, the things that go through your head when you're going through some traumatic experience. Again, this almost has a folk song structure to it, but because it is completely a cappella, she can play with that structure, move the melody around as much as she wants. And she goes on excursions that are pretty far from the very intentionally simple melody that she starts with that ties into the thoughts that are going through your head at a time like this. I like also how, in addition to playing with the melody, she plays with meter and the rhythm a lot. And I'm not even sure if I would call it meter. It's more just rubato, if we're really being specific. But again, not many pop songs in the 90s have this extent of rubato in them. And again, who the hell else was including acapella tracks on albums in the 90s? I think that this was like a really bold choice, especially for first album. Like I could imagine that she had some hard conversations with the producers about including this song. And yet it's kind of one of her most iconic songs now. I mean, people associate this with the start of Rain and all her work with sexual assault victims, which is a beautiful thing. I like how in Tori's mature albums, toward the end, there's always, well, actually, no, even in Why Can't Tori Read, toward the end of the album, there are one or two tracks that have really quite disparate parts to them that sort of like go on journeys and i feel like little earthquakes is the first example of what gets more intense and more charmingly bizarre in her later albums in the way you have no idea what could possibly come next when it gets to the give me life give me pain part there's no way you could have guessed that that would come next on your first listening and i love that about it i like this one as well because every time you think oh it's another like light rock ballad it proves you wrong i could picture it maybe selling well on mom rock until that part or um there are a few other parts i'm sure that if i were listening back more closely i would name i think it's a good final track for the album it really ties it together because now that we've talked through all of it i think another thematic through line here is as she puts it little earthquakes like all the little sort of slice of life moments of self-doubt you have and of questioning other people and i would probably say precious things is the most boisterous track on the album and even at that when you examine what she's talking about there it's not huge events really the only huge event on the album is me and a gun and ironically, that song is in many ways the smallest, like in terms of texture, in terms of, you know, the things we just talked about. I think this thematically ties the album together well. I really like how much repetition there is in Little Earthquakes, the song. She does it right. Each time that something is repeated, it means something slightly different. There's a little bit of a shade of different performance to it. And I really like that. That's most obviously showcased in the like, give me life, give me pain section, because it starts off with just a kind of creepy choral chant almost that explodes into something that's so big and emotional that she can't even use a word for it anymore. It's just a long melisma on the vowel E. It's sort of like the melisma is the most important part of the song again in this. It's sort of also like what you were saying, the little things add up to something big. Even though it feels like we're just carrying something small, you can't carry too many small things because they turn into a big thing then. I think it's a cohesive album as a whole. The debut solo album of any artist is really critical because you're, it's your first impression to the public. And I think this album does what the first album should do, which is it sets a hallmark of what to expect from Tori. Now, of course, she definitely challenges those expectations with later albums, but I think this is a good first album. And I think it's remarkably cohesive given that this album was written in two chunks. There was an original 12 tracks that Tori gave to the record label and they rejected it and said they wanted her to redo some of it. The first version of the album included the tracks Crucify, Silent All These Years, Winter, Happy Phantom, Leather, and Mother, all produced by one producer. And then they rejected that, plus the other tracks. I don't know specifically what they were, but I think it's probably most of the B-sides of this album. So then she worked with her boyfriend at the time, and the two of them pr together produced more songs, Girl, Precious Things, Tear in Your Hand, 
Me and a Gun, and Little Earthquakes. And I just can't imagine what the album would have been without those five songs. As we talked about, the album really needs precious things. But I also think Tear in Your Hand and Little Earthquakes and Me and a Gun... Well, and Girl. I think they're all like essential to what the song is. There's also China that was produced by someone else, by a third producer. And I don't know at what stage China was in the album listing. Album sequencing. I think this is basically a perfectly sequenced album for the reasons that we talked about going through. I like the sequencing on this album. I think it tells a story, which is nice. Album art. I put that I felt like it was a little basic, but I'm actually changing that response. After our conversation about the themes, I think it fits the thematic context of the album well. I think this is a great album. My overall score I gave it was a 95 out of 100, and I think it's a good introduction to Tori, as I've said before, and it sort of will always have a special place in my heart. It's a place I go to when I'm feeling emotional and I need an outlet to listen to. Yeah, yeah, I I think you're right about being the right place to start with Tori. Like with many artists, I would suggest people start with what I think is their best album. But with Tori, even though I don't think Little Earthquakes is her best album, it's the right place to start to get into her. It's the most accessible of her good albums and it is simple direct very good songwriting i gave the album 93 i played around with that number a lot because i was thinking about what i had scored other albums and thinking ahead to other tory albums so i felt like 93 was right then our scores in the formula spat out a 93 also so that averages out to being a 94 for this album. Good job, Tori. You finally were no longer silent. <laughs> this album is meaningful to a lot of people for the right reasons. And I hope that more people continue to discover it and love it as much as we do moving forward. Speaking of our love for it, we covered the song Girl, which will be coming out in next week's video. So listen for that. Thanks for watching. To this side is a video that YouTube thinks you might like. So check that out. Give this video a like if you liked it. Give it a pity like if you didn't like it. Leave us a comment if you have any thoughts, because I'm sure if you know the songs on this album, you have thoughts on them. Up there, eh, up there is the button, uh, that side, yeah, yeah, (laughs) is the button that you can use to click to subscribe to the channel. We review music, video games, and other pieces of media. That should be good. Maintain your groovy selves. See y'all next time.